Welcome to the Thousand Nights and One Night. Now, when it was the hundred and forty-first night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the wounded rider spake thus to Kanmakan. Then came out the same Kardash, and fell on the old woman and her men, and bore down upon them, bashing them. Nor was it long before they bound her and the ten slaves, and bore off their captives and the horse, rejoicing. When I saw this, I said to myself, my pains were in vain, nor did I attain my gain. However, I waited to see how the affair would fare, and when the old woman found herself in bonds, she wept and said to the captain, Kardash, O oh, thou doughty champion and furious knight, what wilt thou do with an old woman and slaves, now that thou hast thy will of the horse? And she beguiled him with soft words, and she sware that she would send him horses and cattle till he released her and her slaves. Then he went his way, he and his comrades, and I followed them till they reached this country. And I watched them till at last I found an opportunity of stealing the horse, whereupon I mounted him and drawing a whip from my wallet, struck him with it. When the robbers heard this, they came out on me and surrounded me on all sides and shot arrows and cast spears at me whilst I stuck fast on his back. And he fended me with hooves and forehand till at last he bolted out with me from amongst them like unerring shaft or or shooting star but in the stress and the stow i got sundry grievous wounds and sore and since that time i have passed on his back three days without tasting food or sleeping aught so that my strength is down brought and the world is become to me as naught but thou hast dealt kindly with me and hast shown ruth on me and I see thee naked stark, and sorrow hath set on thee its marks. Yet are signs of wealth and gentle breeding manifest on thee. So tell me, what and whence art thou, and whither art thou bound? Answered the prince, My name is Khan Makan, son of Za o Makan, son of King Omar bin al Nu'uman. When my father died, and an orphan lot was my fate, a base man seized the throne and became king over small and great. Then he told him all his past from first to last. And the horse thief said to him, for he pitied him, By Allah, thou art one of the high degree and exceeding nobility, and thou shalt surely attain a state sublime and become the first cavalier of thy time. If thou can lift me on horseback and mount thee behind me and bring me to my own land, thou shalt have honor in this world and a reward on the day of band calling to band. For I have no strength left to steady myself. And if this be my last day, the steed is thine alway, for thou art worthier of him than any other. Quoth Khan Makan, By Allah, if I could carry thee on my shoulders, or share my days with thee, I would do this deed without the steed. For I am of a breed that loveth to do good, and to succor those in need. And the one kindly action in Almighty Allah's honor averteth need and calamities for its doer. So, make ready to set out and put thy trust in the subtle, the all-wise. And he would have lifted him on to the horse and fared forward, trusting in Allah, aider of those who seek aid. But the horse thief said, wait for me a while. Then he closed his eyes and opening his hand said, I testify that there is no God but the God. And I testify that Mohammed is the apostle of God. And he added, O oh, glorious one, pardon me my mortal sin, for none can pardon mortal sins save immortal. And he made ready for death and recited these couplets. I have wronged mankind, and have ranged like wind o'er the world, and in wine cups my life has passed. I've swum torrent course to bear off the horse, and my guile's high places on plain have cast. Much I've tried to win, and o'er much my sin, and the tool of my winnings is most and last. I had hoped of this steed to gain wish and need, but vain was the end of this journey vast. I have stolen through life, and my death in strife was doomed by the Lord, who hath all forecast. And I have told these tolls to their fatal end, for an orphan, a pauper sans kith or friend. And when he finished his verses, he closed his eyes and opened his mouth. Then with a single death rattle, he left this world. Thereupon, Kanmakan rose 
and dug a grave and laid him in the dust. After what she went up to the steed and kissed him and wiped his face and joyed with exceeding joy, saying, None hath the fellow of this down in, no, not even King Sasan. Such was the case of Khan Makan. But as regards King Sasan, presently news came to him that the wazir Dandan had thrown off his allegiance with him. Half the army who swore that they would have no king but Khan Makan and the minister had bound the troops by a solemn covenant and had gone with them to the island of India and to Berberland and to Blackland where he had levied armies from far and near like unto the swollen sea for fear and none could tell the host's van from its rear and the minister was resolved to make for baghdad and take the kingdom inward and slay every soul who dare retard having sworn not to return the sword of war to its sheath till he had made khan makan king when this news came to sasan he was drowned in the sea of appall knowing that the whole state had turned against him great and small and his trouble redoubled and his care became despair so he opened his treasuries and distributed his monies among his officers and he prayed for khan makan's return that he may draw his heart to him with fair usage and bounty and make him commander of those troops which ceased not being faithful to him so much he quenched the sparks ere they became a flame now when the news of this reached Khan Makan by the merchants, he returned in haste to Baghdad on the back of a force said stallion, and his king Sasan sat perplexed upon his throne. He heard of the coming of Khan Makan, whereupon he dispatched all the troops and headmen of the city to meet him. So all who were in Baghdad fared forth and met the prince and escorted him to the palace and kissed the thresholds whilst the damsels and the eunuchs went in to his mother and gave her the fair tidings of his return. She came to him and kissed him between the eyes, but he said to her, O oh, mother mine, let me go to my uncle King Sasan, who hath overwhelmed me with well and boon. And while he did so, all the palace people and headmen marveled at the beauty of the stallion and said, No king is like unto this man. So Khan Makan went into King Sasan and saluted him as he rose to receive him and kissing his hands and feet, offered him the horse as a present. The king greeted him, saying, Welcome, and welcome to my son, Khan Makan. By Allah, the world hath been straitened on me by reason of thine absence, but praise be it to Allah for thy safety. And Khan Makan called down blessings on him. Then the king looked at the stallion, al Katal height, and knew him for the very horse he had seen in such and such a year whilst beleaguering the cross-worshippers of Constantinople with Khan Makan's sire, Zaal Makan. That time they slew his uncle, Shah Khan. So he said to the prince, If thy father could have come by this courser, he would have brought it with a thousand blood horses. But now let the honor return to the honorable. We accept the steed, and we give him back to thee as a gift. For to him thou hast more right than any white, being knightliest of knights. Then King Sasan bade bring forth for him dresses of honor, and led horses, and appointed to him the chief lodging in the palace, and showed him the utmost affection and honor, because he feared the issue of the wazir Dandan's doings. At this, Khan Makan rejoiced, and shame and humiliation ceased from him. Then he went to his house, and going to his mother, asked, O oh, my mother, how is it with the daughter of my uncle? answered she by allah o oh my son my concern for thy absence hath distracted me from any other even from thy beloved especially as she was the cause of thy strangerhood and thy separation from me then he complained to her of his case saying o oh my mother go to her and speak with her haply she will vouchsafe me her sight to see and dispel me from my this despondency replied his mother idle desires abase men's necks so put away from thee this thought that can only vex, for I will not win to her, nor go into her with such a message. Now when he heard his mother's words, he told her what said the horse thief concerning Zat al Dawai, how the old woman was then in their land, proposing to make Baghdad, and added, It was she who slew my uncle and my grandfather, 
and needs I must avenge them with man boat, that our reproach be wiped out. Then she left her and repaired to an old woman, a wicked, horrid, pernicious beldam by name of Sa Adonai, and complained to her of this case and of what he suffered for love of his cousin Kuzia Fakan, and begged her to go to her and win her favor for him. I hear and I obey, answered the old hag, and leaving him betook herself to Kuzia Fakan's palace that she might intercede with her in this behalf. Then she returned to him and said, Of a truth, Kuzia Fakan saluteth thee and promised to visit thee this night about midnight. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day and ceased saying her permitted say. Now, when it was the hundred and forty-second night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that when the old woman came to Kanmakan and said, Of a truth, the daughter of thine uncle saluteth thee, and she will visit thee this night about midnight, he rejoiced and sat down to await the fulfillment of his cousin's promise. But before the hour of night she came to him, wrapped in a veil of black silk, and she went in to him and aroused him from his sleep, saying, How canst thou pretend to love me when thou art sleeping heart-free in a complete content? So he awoke and he said, by Allah, <laughs> O desire of my heart, I slept not, but in the hope that thine image might visit my dreams. Then she chid him with soft words, and began versifying in these couplets. Hast thou been leal in love's loyalty, ne'er had a sl supper of sleep to seal thine eyes? O thou who claimest lover loyalty, treading the lover's path of pain and pine. By Allah, O my cousin, never yet did eyes of lover sleep such sleep in thine. Now, when he heard his cousin's words, he was abashed before her and rose and excused himself. Then they embraced and complained to each other of anguish of separation, and they ceased not thus till dawn broke and day dispersed itself over the horizon, when she rose preparing to depart. Upon this, Kanmakan wept and sighed and began improvising these couplets. O thou who dinest come to a sore sign, Whose lips, those teeth like necklace pearls enshrine. I kissed him thousand times and clipped his waist And spent the night with cheek to cheek close in line. Till the depart as twain came dawning day, Like sword edge drawn from sheath in radiant line. And when he ended his poetry, Kuzi Efekan took leave of him and returned to her palace. Now certain of her damsels became aware of her secret, and one of these slave girls disclosed it to King Sasan, who went into Kuzia Fakan, and drawing his saber upon her, would have slain her. But her mother, Nuzat al-Zaman, entered and said to him, By Allah, do her no harm. If thou hurt her, the report will be noised among the folk, and thou shalt become a reproach against the kings of the age. Know thou that Khan Makan is no son of adultery, but a man of honor and nobility, who would not do this <clears throat> would do not that could shame him and was reared with him so be not hasty for verily their report is spread abroad among all the palace people and all the folk of baghdad how the wazir dandan hath levied armies from all countries and is on his way hither to make khan makan king quoth sasan by allah needs must i cast him into such calamity that neither earth shall support him nor sky shall shallow him I did not speak him fair and show him favor because of my lieges and my lords, lest they incline to him, but right soon shall we see what shall be tied. Then he left her, and he went out to the order of the affairs of the realm. Such, then, was the case of King Sasan. But as regards Khan Makan on the next day, he came in to his mother and said, O oh, my mother, I am resolved to ride forth a raiding and a looting, and I will cut the road of caravans and lift horses and flocks, negroes and white slaves, and as soon as I have collected great store and my case is better galore, I will demand my cousin Kuzia Fakan in marriage of my uncle Sasan, replied she. O oh, my son of a truth, the goods of men are not ready to hand like a scape camel, for on this side of them are sword strokes and lance lungings and men that eat the wild beasts and lay country's waste and chase lynxes and hunt lions. Quoth he, 
heaven forfend that I turn back from my resolve till I have won to my will. Then he dispatched the old woman to Kuzia Fakan to tell her that he was about to set out in a quest of a marriage settlement befitting her, saying to the bedlam, Thou needs must pray her to send me an answer. I hear and I obey, replied the old woman, and going forth presently returned with Kuzia Fakan's reply, which was, She will come to thee at midnight. So he abode away till one half of the night was past, when restlessness got hold of him, and before he was awake, he came in to him, saying, My life by thy ransom from wakefulness. And he sprang up to receive her, exclaiming, Oh, desire of my heart, my life be thy redemption from all ills and evils. Then he acquainted her with his intent, and she wept. But he said, Weep not, O daughter of my uncle, for I beseech him who decreed our separation to vouchsafe us reunion and fair understanding. Then Khan Makan, having fixed a day for departure, went into his mother and took leave of her, after which came he down from his palace and threw the baldric of his sword over his shoulder and donned turban and face veil and mounted his horse, al Kutal, and looking like the moon at its full, he threaded the streets of Baghdad till he reached the city gate. And behold, there he found Saba bin Rama coming out of town, and his comrade, seeing him, ran to his stirrup and saluted him. He returned his salutation, and Saba asked him, O oh, my brother, how camest thou by this good steed and this sword and clothes, whilst I up to this present time have gotten nothing but my sword and target? Answered Khan Makan, The hunter returneth not but with quarry after the measure of his intention. A little after thy departure fortune came to me, so now say, wilt thou go with me and work thine intent in my company and journey with me into the desert? Replied Saba. By the Lord of Kaaba, from this time forth I will call thee not but my lord. Then he ran on before the horse with his sword hanging from his neck and his budget between his shoulder blades, and Khan Makan rode a little behind him, and they plunged into the desert for the space of four days, eating of the gazelles and drinking water of the springs. On the fifth day they drew near a high hill, at whose foot was a spring encampment and a deep running stream, and the knolls and hollows were filled with camels and cattle, and sheep and horses, and little children played about the pens and foals. When Khan Makah saw this, he rejoiced at the sight, and his breast was filled with delight. So he addressed himself to fight, that he might take the camels and the cattle, and said to Saba, Come, fall with us upon this loot, whose owners have left it unguarded here, and we do battle for it with near and far. So happily may fall to our lots of good some share, replied Saba. O oh my lord, verily they to whom these herd belong be many in number, and among them are doughty horsemen and fighting footmen, and if we venture lives in this daring do, we shall fall into danger great, and neither of us will return safe from this bait, but we shall both be cut off by fate and leave our cousins desolate. Then Khan Makan laughed and knew that he was a coward. So he left him, and he rode down the rise, intent on rapine, with loud cries and chanting these couplets. O oh, a valiant race are the sons of Nu'uman, braves whose blades shred heads of the foeman clan, a tribe who, when tried in the tussle of war, taketh prowess stand in the battle van, in their tents safe, close, Gebulunzi I, nor his poverty's ugly features scan, and I, for their agents, sue of them, who is king of kings and made soul of man? Then he rushed upon the she-camels, like a he-camel in rut, and drove all but before him, sheep and cattle and horses and dromedaries. Therewith the slaves ran at him with their blades so bright and their lances so long, and at the head rode a Turkish horseman, who was indeed a stout champion, doughty in fray and in battle chance, and skilled to wield the nut-brown lance and the blade with bright glance. He drove at Khan Makan, saying, Woe to thee, knewest thou to whom these herds belong, thou hadst not done this deed. Know that they are the goods of the band Grecian, the champions of the ocean, and the troop Caesarian. And this troop containeth none but valiant whites, numbering an hundred knights, who have cast off the allegiance of every sultan. But there hath been stolen from them a noble stallion, and they have vowed not to return hence without him. 
Now, when Khan Makan heard these words, he cried out, saying, O oh, villain, this I bestride is the steed whereof ye speak, and after which ye seek, and ye would do battle with me for his sake? So come out against me, all of you at once, and do your dowers for the knots. Then he shouted between the ears of all Kapal, who ran at them like a gull, whereupon Khan Makan let drive at the Turk, and ran him through the body, and threw him from his horse, and let out his life, after which he turned upon a second, and a third, and a fourth, and also of life bereft them. When the slaves saw this, they were afraid of him, and he cried out and said to them, Ho, sons of whores, drive out the cattle and the stud, or I will dye my spear in your blood. So they untethered the beast and began to drive them, and Saba came down to Khan Makan with a loud voicing and hugely rejoicing when, lo, there arose a cloud of dust, and it grew till it walled the view, and there appeared under it riders and hundred, like lions and hundred. Upon this, Saba took flight and fled to the hill's topmost height, leaving the assailable sight and enjoyed sight of the fight, saying, I am no warrior but in sport, and I just, I delight. Then the hundred cavaliers made towards Khan Makan, surrounded him on all sides, and one of them accosted him, saying, Whither goest thou with this loot? Quoth he, I have made it my prize, and I am carrying it away, and I forbid you from it. And come on to the battle, come into the combat, for know you that he who is before you is a terrible lion, and an honorable champion, and a sword that cutteth wherever it turneth. When the horseman heard these words, he looked at Khan Makan and saw that he was a knight, like a mane-clad lion in might, whilst his face was as the full moon rising on its fourteenth night, and valor shone from between his eyes. Now, that horseman was the captain of the hundred horse, and his name was Kardash. And when he saw Kard Khan Makan, the perfection of Calvaris, with surpassing gifts of comeliness, his beauty reminded him of a beautiful mistress of his whose name was Fatim. Now, she was one of the fairest of women in face, but Allah had given her charms and grace and noble qualities of all kinds, such as tongue faileth to explain, and which ravished the hearts of men. Moreover, the cavaliers of the tribe feared her prowess, and all the champions of that land stood in awe of her high spirit, and she had sworn that she would not marry, nor let any possess her, except he should conquer her in combat, Ka Dash being one of her suitors. And she said to her father, None shall approach me, save he be able to deal me overthrow in the field, instead of war thrust and blow. Now when this news reached Kardash, he scorned to fight with a girl, fearing reproach, and one of his intimates said to him, Thou art complete in all conditions of beauty and goodliness. So if thou contend with her, even though she be stronger than thou, thou must needs overcome her. For when she seeth thy beauty and grace, she will be discomforted before thee, and yield thee the victory. For verily, women have a need of men, in as thou heedest full plain. Nevertheless, Kardash refused and would not contend with her. And he ceased not to abstain from her thus till he met from Khan Makan that which hath been set down. Now he took the prince for his beloved Fatin and was afraid, albeit indeed she loved him for what she had heard of his beauty and valor. So he went up to him and said, Woe to thee, O Fatin! Thou comest here to show me thy prowess, but now alight from thy steed that I may talk with thee, for I have lifted these cattle and have foiled my friends and waylaid many a brave and a man in knightly race, all for the sake of thy beauty, a form and face, which are without peer. So marry me now, that king's daughter may serve thee, and thou shalt become queen of these countries. When Kamakan heard these words, the fires of wrath flamed up in him, and he cried out, Woe to thee, O Persian dog! Leave Fatin and thy trust and mistrust, and come to cut and thrust, for as soon thou shalt lie in the dust. And so saying, he began to wheel about him, and assail him, and feel the way to prevail. But when Kardash observed him closely, he knew him for a doughty knight, 
and a stalwart in fight, and the air of his starts became manifest to him. When as he saw the green down on his cheeks to spread like myrtle springing from the heart of a rose bright red, and he feared his onslaught, and quoth he to those with him, Woe to you! Let one of you charge down upon him, and show him the keen sword and the quivering spear. For know that when many do battle with one man, it is a foul shame, even though he be a Kemperly White and an invincible knight. Upon this, there ran at Conmacon a horseman, like a lion in fault, mounted on a black horse with hoofs snow white, and a star on his forehead, the bigness of a Durham, astounding wit and sight, as he were Abjar, which was Antar's to steer, even as saith of him the poet. The courser charges on battling foe, mixing heaven on high with earth down low. And so the morning had blazed his brow, and he rends her vitals as quid pro quo. He rushed upon Conmacon, and they wheeled about a while, giving blows and taking blows, such as confound the sprite and dim the sight. But Conmacon was the first to smite the foe, a swashing blow that rove through turban and iron skill cap and reached his head. And he fell from his steed with the fall of a camel which rolled over. Then a second came out to him and offered battle, and in like guise a third, a fourth, a fifth, and he did with all of them all that was done with the first. Thereupon the rest at once rushed upon him, for indeed they were roused by rage and wild with wrath, but it was long before he had pierced them all with the point of his spear. When Kardash saw these feats of arms, he feared death, for he knew that the youth was stoutest of heart, and concluded that he was unique among knights and braves. And he said to Conmacon, I waive my claim to thy blood, and I pardon thee the blood of my comrades. So take what thou wilt of the cattle and wend thy ways, for thy firmness in fight moveth my ruth, and life is better for thee than death. Replied Conmacon, Thou lackest not of the generosity of the noble. But leave this talk, and run for thy life, and wreck not in blame, nor think to get back the booty, but take the straight path for thine own safety. Thereupon, Kardash waxed exceedingly wroth, and rage moved him to the cause of his death. So he said to Kanmakan, Woe to thee, and thou knew who I be. Thou wouldst not wield these words in the open field. I am the lion to bash known as Kardash. He who spoileth great kings, and waylayeth all travellings, and seizeth the merchant's precious things. And the steed under thee is that I am seeking, and I call upon thee to tell me how thou camest by him, and hast him in thy keeping. Replied Conmacon, Know thou that this steed was being carried to my uncle, King Sasan, under the escort of an ancient dame, high in rank, attended by ten slaves, when thou fellest upon her, and tookest the horse from her. And I have a debt of blood against the old woman for the sake of my grandfather, King Omar bin al Nu'uman, and my uncle, King Sharakan. Woe to thee, quoth Karadash, who is thy father? O thou that hast no lawful mother, quoth he, know that I am Khan Makan bin Za al Makan, son of Omar bin al Nu'uman. But when Kardash heard this address, he said, Thy perfection cannot be denied, nor yet the union in thee of the knightly virtue and seemly head. And he added, Fair in peace, for thy father showed us favor. Rejoin Khan Makan, By Allah, I will not deign to honor thee, old wretch. I disdain so far as to overcome thee in battle plain. Upon this, the Badawai waxed wroth, and they drove at each other, shouting aloud whilst their horse pricked their ears and raised their tails, and they ceased not clashing together with such a crash that it seemed each its firmament were split in sunder, and they continued to strive like two rams which butt, smiting and exchanging with their swords thrust and cut. Presently, Kardash foined at Kanmakan, but he evaded it and rejoined upon him, so pierced him through the breast that the spearhead issued from his back. Then he collected the horses and the plunder, and he cried out to the slaves, saying, Up, and be driving as hard as you may. 
Hearing this down came Saba, and accosting Kanmakan said, Right well hast thou died, O knight of the age. Verily I prayed Allah for thee, and the Lord heard my prayers. Then he cut off Kardash's head, and Kanmakan laughed and said, Woe to thee, O Saba! I thought thee a rider fain of fight. Quoth the Badawai, Forget not thy slave in the diversion of the spoil so happily. Therewith I will marry my cousin Najma. Answered Kanmakan, Thou shalt assuredly share in it. But now keep watch over the booty and the slaves. Then he set out his home, and he ceased not journeying night and day till he drew near Baghdad city. And all the troops heard of Kanmakan, and saw what was his loot, and cattle, and the horse thief's head on the point of Saba's spear. Also, for he was a noted highwayman. The merchants knew Kardash's head, and rejoiced, saying, Allah hath rid mankind of him. Thereupon, all the people of Baghdad came to Kanmakan, seeking to know what adventures had befallen him, and he told them what had passed. Whereupon all men were taken with awe of him, and the knights and champions feared him. Then he drove his spoils under the palace walls, and planting the spearhead on whose point was Kardash's head, over against the royal gate, gave largesse to the people of Baghdad, distributing horses and camels, so that all loved them and their hearts inclined to him. Presently he took Saba and lodged him in a spacious dwelling, and gave him a share of the loot, after which he went into his mother, and told her all that had befallen him in his last journey. Meanwhile, the news of him reached the king, who rose from his levy, and shutting himself up with his chief officer, said to them, Know ye that I desire to reveal to you my secret, and acquaint you with the hidden facts of my case, and further know that Kanmakan will be the cause of our being uprooted from this kingdom, our birthplace, for he hath slain Kardash, albeit he had with him the tribes of the Kurds and the Turks, and our affair with him will end in our destruction, seeing that most part of our troops are his kinsmen. And ye weet what Wazir Dandan hath done, how he disowned me, after all I have shown him of favors, and after being faithful, he hath turned traitor. And it hath reached me that he hath levied an army in the provinces, and hath planned to make Kanmakan sultan, for that the sultanate with his fathers and his grandfathers, and assuredly he will slay me without mercy. Now, when the lords of the realm heard from him these words, they replied, O king, verily that his man is unequal to this, and did we not know him? To have been reared by thee? Not one of us would approve of him. And know that thou, we are at thy command. If thou desire his death, we will do him die. And if thou wilt remove him, we will remove him. Now, when King Sasan heard this, he said, Verily, to slay him were wise, but needs must ye swear an oath to it. So all swear to slay Kanmakan without giving him a chance, to the end that when the wazir Dandan should come and hear of his death, his force might be weakened, and he fail of his design. When they had made this compact and covenant with him, the king honored them with the highest honors, and presently retired to his own apartments. But the officers deserted him, and the troops refused their service, and would neither mount nor dismount until they should espy what might befall. For they saw that most of the army was the wazir Dandan. Presently, the news of these things came to Kuzia Fakan, and caused her much concern, so that she sent for the old woman who was wont to carry messages between her and her cousin. And when she came, bade her, <clears throat> bade her to go to him and warn him of the plot. Whereto he replied, Bear my salutation to the daughter of my uncle, and say to her, Verily, the earth is of Allah, to whom might belong might and majesty. And he giveth as heritage to whomsoever of his servants he willeth. How excellent is the saying of the sayer. Allah holds kinship. Whoso seeks without him victory shall be cast out with soul condemned to hell of low degree. Had I or any other man a finger breadth of land, the rule were changed and a men a twain of partner gods would see. Then the old woman returned to Kuzia Fakan and told her his reply, and acquainted her that he abode in the city. Meanwhile, King Sasan awaited his faring forth from Baghdad, that he might send after him someone who would slay him, till it befell one morning that Kanmakan went out to course and chase, accompanied by Saba, 
who would not leave him night or day. He caught ten gazelles, and among them one that had tender black eyes, and turned right and left. So he let her go, and Saba said to him, Why dost thou free this gazelle? Kanmakan laughed, and set the others free also, saying, It is only humane to release gazelles that have young, and this one turned not from side to side, save for her fawns. So I let her go, and released the others in her honor. Quoth Saba, Do thou release me, that I may go to my people? At this, Kanmakan laughed, and smote him with a spear butt on the breast, and he fell to the ground, squirming like a snake. Whilst they were thus doing, behold, they saw a dust cloud spiring high, and heard the tramp of horses, and presently there appeared under it a plump of knights and braves. Now the cause of their coming was this. Some of his followers had acquainted King Sasan with Kanmakan's going out to the chase, so he sent for an emir of the Dalamalites called Jami, and twenty of his horsemen, and gave them money and bade them slay Khan Makan. So when they drew near the prince, they charged him down, and he met them in mid-charge and killed them all to the last man. And behold, King Sasan took horse and riding out to meet his people, found them all slain, whereout he wounded and turned back, when lo, the people of the city laid hands on him and bound him straightly. As for Khan Makan, after that invention, he left the palace behind him and rode onward with Saba, the Badwai. And while he went, lo, he saw a youth sitting at the door of a house on his road and saluted him. The youth returned his greeting and going into the house brought out two platters, one full of soured milk and the other of brewis swimming in clarified butter. And they set the platter before Khan Makan, saying, Favor us by eating of our victuals." But he refused, and quoth the young man to say, What aileth thee, O man, that thou wilt not eat? Quoth Kamakan, I have a vow upon me. The youth asked, What is the cause of thy vow? And Kamakan answered, Know that King Sasan seized upon my kingdom like a tyrant and an enemy, although it was my father's and my grandfather's before me. Yet he became master of it, and forced, after my father's death, took no count of me by reason of my tender years. So I bound myself by a vow to eat no man's victuals till I have eased my heart of my foe. Rejoined the youth, Rejoice, for Allah hath fulfilled thy vow. Knoweth that he hath been imprisoned in a certain palace, and methinks he will die? Asked Khan Makan, And what house is he confined? Under yon high dome, answered the other. The prince looked and saw the folk entering and buffeting Sasan, who was suffering the agonies of the dying. So he arose and went up to the pavilion and noted what was therein. After which he returned to his palace and sitting down to the proffered victuals, ate what sufficed him and put the rest in his wallet. Then he took seat in his own place and ceased not sitting till it was dark night and the youth whose guest he was slept. When he arose and repaired to the pavilion where Sasan was confined. Now about it were dogs guarding it and one of them sprang at him. So he took out of his budget a bit of meat and threw it to him. He ceased not casting flesh to the dogs till he came to the pavilion and making his way to where King Sasan was laid his head upon his hand, whereupon he said in a loud voice, Who art thou? He replied, I am Khan Makan, whom thou stravest to kill. But Allah made thee fall into thine own evil device. Did it not suffice thee to take my kingdom and the kingdom of my father, but thou must propose to slay me? And Sasal swore a false oath that he had not plotted his death and that the brute was untrue. So Kankan forgave him and said to him, Follow me. Quoth he, I cannot walk a single step for weakness. Quoth Kan Makan, If thou case be thus, we will get us two horses and ride forth, I and thou, and seek the open. So he did. And he took the horse with Sasan and rode till daybreak when they prayed the dawn prayer and fared on and ceased not faring till they came to a garden where they sat down and talked. Then Khan Makan rose to Sasan and said, Is aught left to set thy heart against me? No, by Allah, replied Sasan. So they agreed to return to Baghdad and Saba the Badawai said, I will go before you to give folk the fair tidings of your coming. Then he rode on in advance, equating men and women with the good news. So all the people came out to meet Khan Makan with tabrets and pipes 
and Kuzia Fakan also came out like the full moon shining in all her splendor of light through the thick darkness of the night. So Khan Makan met her, and soul yearned to soul, and body longed for body. There was no talk among the people of the time but of Khan Makan, for the knights bore witness of him that he was the most valiant of the folk of the age, and said, It is not right that other than Khan Makan should be our sultan, but the throne of his grandfather shall revert to him as it began. Meanwhile, Khan Makan, Sasan went into his wife, Nuzad al Zaman, who said to him, I hear that the folk talk of nothing but Khan Makan and attribute to him such qualities as tongue never can. He replied, Hearing of a man is not like seeing a man. I have seen him, but have noted in him none of the attributes of perfection. Not all that is heard is said, but folk ache one another in extolling and cherishing him, and Allah maketh him praises to run on the lips of men, so that there incline to him the hearts of the people of Baghdad and of the wazir Dandan, that perfidious and treacherous man, who hath levied troops from all lands and taketh to himself the right of naming a king of the country. And whoso chooses that he shall be under the hand of an orphan ruler whose worth is not, ask Nuzat al Zaman, when then is it that thou proposest to do? And the king answered, I mean to kill him that the wazir may be balked of his intent and return to his allegiance, seeing nothing for it but my service. Quoth she, in good sooth and perfidy, with strangers is a foul thing, and how much more with kith and kin. The righteous deed to do would be to marry him to thy daughter Kuzia Fakan and give heed to what was said of old time. And fate some person sablish over thy head, and thou being worthier her choice of braid, yet do him honor due to his estate, to bring the wheel through far or near thou bade, nor speak thy thought of him, else shalt thou be of those who shall degrade from honors great. Many harems are lovelier than the bride, but time and fortune lent the bride their aid. When Sasan heard these words and comprehended what her verse intended, he rose from her in anger and said, were it not that thy death would bring on me dishonor and disgrace, I would take off thy head with my blade and make an end of thy breath. Quoth she, Why art thou wroth with me? I did but jest with thee. Then she rose to him and bust his head with and hand, saying, Right is thy foresight, and I and thou will cast about for some means to kill him forthright. When he heard this, he was glad and said, Make haste and contrive some deceit to relieve me of my grieving, for in my sooth the door of device is straightened upon me. Replied she, At once I will devise for thee to do away with his life. How so? asked he. And she answered, By means of our female slave, the so-called Bakun. Now this Bakun was past mistress in all kinds of knavery, and was one of the most pestilent of old women, whose religion to abstain from wickedness was not lawful. She brought up Kuzia Fakan and Khan Makan, who had her in so great affection that he used to sleep at her feet. So when King Sasan heard his wife name her, he said, Right is thy wrecking, and sending for the old woman, told her what had passed, and bade her cast about to kill Khan Makan, promising her all good, replied she, Thy bidding shall be obeyed, but I would have thee, O my lord, give me a dagger, which hath been tempered in water of death, that I may dispatch him the speedier for thee. Quoth Sasan, and welcome to thee, and gave her a hanger that would devance men's destiny. Now this slave woman had heard stories and verses, and had learned by rote great store of strange sayings and antidotes, so she took the dagger and went out of the room, considering her as she could compass his doom. Then she repaired to Khan Makan, who was sitting and awaiting news of tryst with the daughter of his uncle, Kuzia Fakan. So that night his thought was taken up with her, and the fires of love for her raged in his heart. And while he was thus, behold, the slave woman Bukun went into him and said, Union time is at hand, and the days of disunion are over and gone. Now when he heard this, he asked, How is it with Kuzia Fakan? Bukun 
answered, Know that her time is wholly taken up with love of thee. At this he rose, and doffing his outer clothes, put them on her, and promised her all good. Then said she, Know that I mean to pass this night with thee, that I may tell thee what talk I have heard, and console thee with stories of many passion distraughts, whom love hath made sick. Nay, quoth he, rather, tell me a tale that will gladden my heart, and gar my cares depart. For joy and good will, answered she. Then she took seat by his side, and that pointyard under her dress, and began to say, Know thou that the pleasantest things my ears ever heard was. Thus we begin the tale of the hashish eater. A certain man loved fair women, and spent his substance on them, till he became so poor that nothing remained of him. The world was straightened upon him, and he used to go about the market streets begging his daily bread. Once upon a time, as he went along, behold, a bit of iron nail pierced his finger and drew blood. So he sat down and wiping away the blood, bound up his finger. Then he arose crying out and fared forwards till he came to a hammock, and entering took off his clothes, and when he looked about he found it clean and empty. So he sat himself down at the fountain basin, and ceased not pouring water on his head till he was tired. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. And so do I cease my tale for the day, till it be morrow.